Real Chat Episode 30, Terminator Salvation. What day is it? What year? 2018. What happened here? Judgment Day happened. We can win this war. We are outnumbered by machines. Shut down, no! And we have all lost so very much. But this is not the future my mother warned me about. Who are you? John Carter! end begins everybody welcome to episode 30 <laughs> what hang on the end begins hang on no so this is the beginning it's a, it's a of, paradox oh my the, god is it the beginning of the end or is the oh no it's like there are no rules except the first rule which is there are no rules so there's one rule technically time is a movie so there are no rules but there's one rule the end begins <laughs> the beginning ends <laughs> Now, that is the greatest intro that we've had here in Real Chat, um, <laughs> <laughs> because we changed it up a little bit. Welcome to episode 30 of Real Chat, a podcast that promises week in, week out, the real world as we know it. Today, we continue our retrospective look at the popular Terminator series by delving into 2009's Terminator Salvation. In a departure from the previous installments, which were set between 1994 and 2004, and used time travel as a key plot element, Salvation is set in the year 2018 and focuses on the war between the human resistance and Skynet's killing machines. It sounded like the film Terminator fans had been dreaming for and willing into existence for years. My name is Adam Stolfo. I'm the big Terminator fanboy, and I am joined here as usual by co-host Bro Safad. Bros, how are you doing? So this is episode 30. Yes. If someone had told me Terminator Salvation <laughs> for your 30th birthday, I'd punch him in the <laughs> face. <laughs> but for real chance, the 30th too. episode, we're yeah. celebrating with Terminator Salvation. <laughs> but I'm all right. Let's get stuck into this one. And welcome back, good friend Stuart Wilson. Stuart, how are you doing? I'm good. Uh, I'm excited to talk about this film purely because it's the film a lot of people wanted and it ended up disappointing everyone yet again. It's, it's, it's the film everyone wanted and then that nobody liked. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now, I could come in absolutely fuming like I did with Terminator 3. <laughs> you know what? I'm just going to tone it down a little tone bit, down. bros. Tone like, let's down. just let's just turn the volume down a little turn bit. Turn it down to a nine and three quarters out of let's, 11. Let's just all, before we start, let's all be in agreement at this point that this is a big stinking pile of turds. Yes. Is that, can we agree? Uh, Stu, you seem reluctant to say it on mic. That's fine. That's fine. What we, I'm more we've already had the first bad film, so it, it can't get that much worse. It can't get can it, worse. Really? But the other thing about this, what I'm curious about with this film is not so much whether it's good or bad. Why? Yeah. Why is it so bad? After Terminator 1 and 2, this is where, if I was in charge, would have taken the series. I would have, well, maybe not, but 
this is the question that's unanswered in the first two. You want to go to the future. You want to see what's happening in the future. You want to go to John Connor's led uh, military uprising. This is the part of the story that's not discovered yet. And to me, it's the logical direction. It, yeah, it makes sense from a, a producer's standpoint. The response to Terminator 3, well, it sounded like it was okay, but it was kind of tepid at best. So let's do something completely different. This will win over the fans. All the people that were disappointed by 3 will want to come and see this film because it's futurewar.com. Exactly. It'll be amazing. The other thing, too, is that we've been through... 2009, we've been through those three underwhelming Star Wars prequels. Audiences are going out in droves, though, to see sci-fi in a big way at the cinema. There's room for this to exist in a broad market. And Christian Bale had just come off The Dark Knight. Dark as Knight's well. around. So there was get a lot away of with hype a, around him. I didn't get away with a darker tone. This film fails on a lot of those levels. So it's an episode again, bros, of our Vintage Vault retrospective series, a conscious... <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I won't have to use the sound effect that time. Uh, a conscious effort to tie in selected shows with something of relevance to the present. And with a fifth film on the popular franchise Terminator Genesis currently in general release around the world, we figured it was a good opportunity to look back in depth at what's made this franchise so popular over the last 31 years. So what are some of your initial thoughts on this film, guys? How do you feel about it? There is even less blue in this film than... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there was in Terminator 3. Let's get back to blue. There's, there's no so, blue. Yeah, let's go back to 2009... This was the time when all computer games were basically Call of Duty, brown and grey. Oh, yes. Everything was brown and grey. Washed, washed out, out. colourless yeah. pellets. And apparently we can blame Saving Private Ryan back in the 90s for starting that. But this is the epitome of no colour films. It's incredible yeah, yeah. how bland the colour palette is. It's based on Technicolor's Oz process, which adds three times more silver to the negative film <laughs> stock. Making it milkier without affecting the grain structure. And although the process was tested in pre-production, it wasn't actually used. Instead, it was its look was sort of mimicked in the digital intermediate sort of process. So that's what they did on this film. The, the only thing I can say is that apparently they did a study on kids playing computer games. And at the time, Call of Duty was really popular. And the only tangible benefit to someone who plays heaps of computer games versus someone who doesn't is that they can distinguish more shades of grey. So in that regard... They probably got more out of this color palette in uh, Salvation <laughs> yeah. than the rest of us did. Yeah. So there you go. I mean, as I said at the top, this is the right jumping off point. It's the right starting point for me for a script is to look at John Connor, the adult, and John Connor, the military leader. After that, it all just falls apart. I have no idea what the whole subplot with um, the Sam Worthington uh, Terminator storyline is. It's such a mess. Spoiler there. It, it's just everything gets messy. Mm. It could have been a great film, or at least it's, it's the start of a good idea. Uh, and then it just has been executed poorly. Yeah, look, um, here's a new real chat motto that we can all take on. Um, if they're not going to try, why should we? All right? <laughs> like, why on earth should we, should we try and find positives in a film written by John Bracanto and Michael <laughs> Ferris? <laughs> Uh, I'd just like to refer everybody back to uh, Terminator 3 episode. It's amazing. To it's find amazing. out more of Adam's thoughts on these two yeah. uh, upstanding gentlemen. One it's thing that I found out in the interim, and I'm not sure if we... I don't think we covered this. The reason Brancato and Ferris got the writing job for this was because they went to college with Mosto. Yeah, that's right. And I, I have no idea how they got the job to write this film. None! Except that maybe they wrote this originally for T3 and pitched yeah. it and failed, and then the studio liked it enough to give them another... I did wonder how many shot. ideas that were left on the cutting room floor yeah. <laughs> during the writing process. I'm not entirely sure. If you watch sure T3, they... all the ideas were left on the cutting room floor, and we ended up with that piece of shit. Clearly, we have no idea how the script writing process works, because I'm pretty sure they don't use scissors and cut stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. We're going to go with that. That's an old reference to um, film editing, isn't it, rather than script writing? But anyway, <laughs> we're mixing our metaphors like a mofo today. Don't you guys find it amazing that it's the same writers as Terminator 3, though. That is spectacular, yeah. I also find it amazing because it is a bit different. It's also bad, but it's clearly different. Yeah. The last film was, as you complained, it repeated so many things we saw in T2. And this film doesn't do that. Yeah, it's almost like the writer said, well, look how bad we can be if we don't repeat what Cameron did. You know, it's <laughs> actually... Equally as bad, but different bad. It's different. You know what I'm going to say? There were awkward pastiches in T3. This has some sly nods to the earlier yeah. films that I didn't notice until I watched it this time, and I, I'm excited to talk about them, actually. Yeah. Because okay. they kind of excited me. Things that you'd only notice on the second viewing, and the only reason you'd have a second viewing is if you work on real chat and you have to watch the film. There is... <laughs> the, I mean, I noticed, though, I've only seen this once, but I noticed it, too, that the... And maybe because it was in the proximity of 
watching the other three films. But, I mean, there's that great moment. There's the nod to the motorbike. It's not used in the third film, but it's an important element in the first and second films, Schwarzenegger on a motorbike. You're talking about the Robo Terminator bikes? The Robo Terminator bikes. They're bad. But, yeah, when John Connor jumps on the bike, and in the third act, and I said this to Adam when I first watched the film, it kind of won me over in the third act in that it spoke to me about a film that could have been. There was a little bit more humour all of a sudden, a little bit more referencing to the original films. Not enough to make the film good. Neither of those are the nods that I, Which I knew about. Well, I'm thinking I should save them and keep the yeah, listeners them. enthralled. Oh, Something to look forward to. Because, you know, after all, in this episode, we have no inflatable, inflatable boobs. boobs. That's right. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> that old cinema trope. But uh, possibly uh, coming up on Real Chat, Stuart's going to talk about a clever moment in this film. That sounds... So, as wow, I can't wait. I know. Can't it wait. sounds unlikely, doesn't it? I, I really can't wait. This film um, also explains to anybody who's ever been curious to why Helena Bottom Carter only worked with her husband for so long, there's plenty of evidence in this film why. Is that right? Well, when she moves away from Tim Burton, it's all just a bit shit. Oh, Excluding... Okay. Uh, yeah, I but yeah. Elfman did the music, so that's, oh, that's the link. That's the, why she's her there. Her other husband. <laughs> <laughs> it's just such a shame that uh, these two like are involved in this one again. And I'm talking about the writers here again, guys. Um, <laughs> I... I they don't understand the first two film, or time travel, or story structure, <laughs> or people. I've saved like, this for this, this particular episode, Adam, and I know you'll be excited about this news, uh, but I read this online, and you won't have seen it yet, because it was just before you got here, and you haven't been online since, but Brancato and Ferris are writing the fourth instalment to Back to the Future, and they've never seen the previous three films, and they don't care that the two bobs have to be dead before a film can be made. So, the... <laughs> Adam has left the building. You guys forgot finishing off the podcast without me? <laughs> I was joking. It's not true. Come back. Come true. back. Come back. It's not true. It's not true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you would burn. Things. Adam just committed Jeez. seppuku. Um, yeah. Nightmare. That, that would, Armageddon would happen. Yes. Yeah, Adam would create Armageddon. I'm back. Would Sorry. cause Armageddon if that was announced to be true. Nicely worked in reference there, bro. Um, anytime. But, uh, anytime. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, how the third one has that you know, rubbish sort of attempt at humor. Um, this one's totally humorless. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, no. Towards the end of the third act, there's a, little, there's a couple of jokes. There's a couple of gags. It kind of lightens up. But it's too little too late. And yeah. you may not even know. Again, they, these two films are very different, but they're both rubbish in their own way. Yeah. So yeah. it kind of goes back to Cameron's love for the Mad Max films. And there's, there's quite a few Mad Max references in the starkness, in the, the man-madeness of some of the technology, and also with that stupid character star that doesn't mm. talk for the whole time, but she doesn't have a bloody boomerang that cuts people's fingers off, so what's the point? <laughs> and she doesn't even bark like a dog. So um, there, there are some Mad Max references, which the second, the, sorry, not the second, the third film throws out the window, whereas this one kind of brings it back. Marcus Wright is the character Sam Worthington. Where the hell is he from? Yes. Is he yes. Irish, English, Australian, American? No idea. No Venezuelan? Idea. I have no idea like, where this guy like is trying from. trying to work out where Russell Crowe in Gladiator is from. Yeah, that's right. But leave so. that alone. Gladiator has sword fighting. That's okay. This one has no sword fighting. <laughs> they don't fight tigers in this film. They don't fight tigers at all. There's not big guys in metal just throwing their weight around. But Sam, I have no idea where Sam Worthington's from. I mean, we know where John Connor's from. He's from Gotham City because it's obviously fucking Batman. <laughs> but I'm John Connor. The um, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> there's even a bit of like, who are you? Use my Batman. Voice. I'm John Connor. <laughs> 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 um, uh, Bail, you're not actually saying words. <laughs> anyway, and also Bail is utterly dislikable as John Connor in this film as well. Are, are we jumping to the cast already? No, 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 no. no, 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 no let's back it off. No, no, no. Back it off. Hold my on, fault. hold on, hold on. My fault. Back it off. My fault. Yeah. Okay. Back it off, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. There's so much I could get into here with this film, and I'm really reeling it back in. All right? Let's go so, through the production companies for this one. A let's, different let's, collection. Yeah. Yet again. As usual. As a normal Terminator film, we've got in, a different... Including cl- uh, production companies I've never heard of. Something else I wanted to <laughs> announce, and this was supposed to be a secret as well. Uh, Terminator 6... <laughs> Real Chat Productions hmm. are involved in that one. Uh, we'll be, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're going to help yeah, well, with the financing, fantastic. so that'll be that'll be good. Uh, we have no creative control, uh, and oh, they are going to make Adam sit there and watch all the rushes after every day shooting. Our motto is "We understand time travel." So, yeah. and our other motto is "If they don't try." <laughs> <laughs> why, 
should we? Why should we? <laughs> you liked that one, didn't you, Bruce? Um, okay. It just gives the listeners a reason to hang around for an hour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the production companies, uh, the Halcyon Company, Wonderland Sound and Vision, Columbia Pictures, and Warner Brothers. Uh, Warner Brothers is back? Yeah, they are back. Okay. Um, it was released on the 21st of May 2009 in the US and the 4th of June 2009 in Australia. So Some argue too soon. It was still too soon. In <laughs> yeah. Still, still too soon. Some people were hoping it'd be released after Genesis, like 80 years after Genesis. So <laughs> exactly right. It didn't happen. It was shot primarily in New Mexico in the US with a budget of an estimated $200 million. That's insane. Now, it, it is, but that's also not insane when you understand how blockbuster movies are made now. No, it's, it's not. Okay. It's, you compare it to T two, and it sounds incredible. But it's also not the most expensive movie ever made, like T two was True. for its time. True. So, True. and unsurprisingly, the lowest grossing Terminator movie so far at three hundred and seventy one point four million worldwide. <coughs> How much? Three hundred and seventy one point four. Which is why we didn't get the uh, the trilogy. Oh, they were yeah. pro- promising. Yeah. Thank God for that. Okay. So. <laughs> Okay, now, just, just quickly, guys, the director of this film, Mc McG, we, we did... McG! Right? Um, Sorry, that was me mimicking Christian Bale, complaining to <laughs> McG. <laughs> McG! This man is like Michael Bay's untalented cousin. Joseph McGinty McG Nickel is surprisingly an American film director, film and television producer, and former record producer. He began his career in the music industry, directing music videos and producing various albums. He later rose to prominence with his first film, Charlie's Angels, which had the highest grossing opening weekend for a dictatorial debut at the time. Since then, he's directed several other films, including Charlie's Angels sequel, Charlie's Angels Full Throttle, and Terminator Salvation, this film. And he co-created the cult television series Fastlane, and executive produced numerous TV programs such as The O.C., Chuck, and Supernatural. Opinions of McG and his directing in this film, guys? Look, when I realised McG directed this film, I was a little bit defensive of McG because for some reason I thought he was a good director. (laughs) And it's because his reputation and obviously his marketing skills and publicity skills are so good that I thought I don't, he'd done more than Charlie's Angels 1 and 2. He should be in marketing and publicity. Like he, like, you know what I mean? Like If someone said, oh, what do you think of McG? I'm like, oh, he does big action blockbuster films quite well, and he's fine. But when you look at the substance of it, he's done nothing. And he, except for the... I mean, I really like Charlie's Angels, and I didn't mind Full Throttle. And I love Chuck as a TV series, at least the first season. But yeah, he's really disappointing, and he hasn't really done anything. And he's, he's much better at publicizing what he's going to do than rather actually doing what he does. To be honest, you say you said poor man's Michael Bay, didn't you? I said he's like Michael Bay's un- untalented cousin. Yeah, you see... <laughs> Michael Bay's films are consistently offensive to me. The direction in this isn't quite so offensive. Michael Bay actually annoys me. In this, it's just not a great film. So I, it's not, I don't have the same hatred. The other thing I guess, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. separating Bay and, and McG for me is the fact that McG's, he's kind of done. Yeah. He's not going to get Michael Bay money ever again. No. Uh, Michael Bay keeps getting Michael Bay money and that drives me crazy <laughs> makes my eye twitch uncontrollable I want Michael Bay's money I want Michael Bay money the um <laughs> god just the money he spends on helicopter shots so I could pay for this apartment oh yeah but yeah I mean Michael Bay frustrates me because mm-hmm. he's an awful director and still manages to have some level of success to keep making films that are continually going to drive me crazy McGee let's spend a moment and just you know pause and reflect on the passing of his career because <laughs> <laughs> he's kind of done. He's not going to get to the heights of... Um, as a director. As a director. Perhaps as, as a, director. a producer, he's oh, going to... As a producer, he's... he's done amazing things. And his credits for producers almost double his directorial he's... credits. He's fine. Keep producing. Keep marketing. Keep publicizing. But his directing career... and Feature film uh, directing career is, is well, like pretty much... Like you said, right. Bryce, he's got a better strength with something like marketing. He should he's be great. doing something he's like that. great at marketing, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about the man himself, Christian Bale. So we are at the cast now, guys. So Christian Bale plays John Connor. No, sorry, uh, let me correct you. He plays John Connor. John Connor with his Batman voice. That's better. Can you imagine for a moment that this is the only Christian Bale film you've ever seen? Yeah. Imagine you would think he was the worst actor in the world. I know. It's like he's the worst of the direct-to-video action star. <laughs> he is. He's so... Yeah. There's a line in this film, and admittedly, he's working with a, with a script, the script he's given, but right near the start, he actually has a line where all he says is, Here! Bravo 10, identify over. Connor! We'll send units to the extraction point. How many survivors are on site? Over. One. 
And that's all he says on the radio. That's the entire half of his conversation. There's so much screaming and yelling in this film, isn't there? Like, I just like, I can't credit how awful he is in this film compared to how many other stunning performances he's had. He's a great yeah. actor, but you wouldn't know it. Oh, from looking at him here it's just incredible and I guess um, uh, evidence shows that he was very frustrated on this set and, oh, he was not, yeah. and he was not happy on set <laughs> McGee deemed Bale the most credible action star in the world during development for this film McGee wanted Bale for Marcus but the actor even though he can't really remember why wanted to play John Oh, wow. Christian Bale oh, really, really wanted to play John Connor. Yeah, right. Uh, he would have been great as Marcus, too, actually. Really it as also Marcus. led to the role of John Connor in this film being majorly expanded because the original Salvation script, before it got rewritten, was a lot less John Connor. Oh, oh that would have a made it very interesting. <clears throat> less. A lot better, I remember. I, I imagine yeah, it, it could have. when he says it eluded him as to why he opted to play John Connor, yeah, well. is this perhaps because John Connor was going to have a role in these two sequels that never appeared? In two Pro- franchises at once, Batman and huh? Terminator? I guess why not? Why not? From Chris what I Pratt gathered, is. though, he just wanted to be the, the central character of these Terminator films, which he just said was John Connor. That's- central character of the franchise. Not yeah. necessarily of this film, though. He's still not, I would oh, say. I know. He's really- it's Marcus Wright's <laughs> film, really. Yeah, I know. You're Except right. that Marcus Wright's um, character has to share and give up half of his screen time to John Connor. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but more interesting than Bale's character or portrayal of Connor is the story of him going absolutely fucking nuts with the film's <laughs> DOP, Shane Helbert. So this is why I didn't mention him just before, because we're sort of going to talk about him now. So he sort of walked into Bale's eye line when he was preparing for his most dramatic scene. And Apparently, yeah. He was supposed to be giving... Which this uh, impassioned on, speech. No, no. Which scene in the film did he get interrupted in, though? Do we know? Yes. Which scene is it? Which what's John Connor doing? That one, like you know, command wants us to fight like machines. They want us to make cold, calculated decisions. But we are not machines. And if we behave like them, then what is the point in winning? The big speech. The really right, okay. bad speech as yeah, well. The really bad. <laughs> yeah, written. but the, yeah. the important. Yes. Part of the film. Yep. Really and that's fair easy. enough. I now, guess now, Christian Bale's on set going, I've got this shit to deal work with right here and I'm trying to make it now, actually play. We might just play a little bit of it. It's important to note that he has since apologised for this and said he was well out of order. <laughs> and when you hear it, he really was. I want you off the fucking set, you prick! I'm sorry. No, don't just be sorry. Think for one fucking second. The, the fuck are you doing?! <laughs> Are you professional or not? Yes, I am. Do I fucking walk around and rip that? No, shut the fuck up, Bruce. Do I want? No. No. Don't shut me up. Am I going to walk around and rip your fucking lights down in the middle of a scene? Then why the fuck are you walking right through? Ah, oh, da-da-da-da, like this in the background. What the fuck is it with you? What don't you fucking understand? You got any fucking idea about... Hey, it's fucking distracting having somebody walking up behind Bryce in the middle of the fucking scene. Give me a fucking answer. What don't you get about it? I was looking at the light. Oh, good for you. And how was it? I hope it was fucking good because it's useless now, isn't it? Fuck's sake, man, you're amateur. Look, gee, you got fucking something to say to this prick? I didn't see it happen. Well, somebody should be fucking watching and keeping an eye on him. Fair enough. This is the second time that he doesn't give a fuck about what is going on in front of the camera. All right? All right? I, I'm trying to fucking do a scene here and I'm going, why the fuck is Shane walking in there? What is he doing there? Do you understand my mind is not in the scene if you're doing that? But he was obviously, so, un- I mean, in his defense, he's obviously under a lot of stress and he's obviously an artist that takes things very seriously. And I'm not saying he deserves bit- to abuse anybody because of that. But at the same time, when you see the resulting film, there's uh, no matter of work Bale could have done to make this At the end as well, on the, as another yeah. teaser as well, bros, I'm going to make mention of my biggest issue with this. And it's cool. not just the fact that Christian Bale went off the rails. It's um, something that McGee, McGee's role as yeah, his director, reaction. Okay, yep. But we'll get to that a little bit later, okay? Yeah, the only thing that comes to mind is the fact that uh, actors obviously... Well, Hollywood movie stars get absurd paychecks. We understand this. And of course... There's a lot of hardworking crews out there. All the people in the crew are doing a really hard job. There's hundreds of people on set. But something that occurs to me, even though the actor perhaps sits in their trailer all day and then waits for their moment when everyone else is doing work, when they come out, they have a good 200 people depending on them. Because if they screw up that scene, 
everything's screwed up. If they have to do take after take yeah. after take... Oh, yeah, they're that, spending money. They're spending money. So yeah. it, it's funny. It, it's Sometimes I think people lose sight of the fact that when the actor actually comes out to do their thing, there's so many people depending on them. There's so much money at stake. Yeah. And they really have to... The amount of pressure on a leading actor in, in a film is immense. Especially for a film like this that has so much setup time because there's visual effects and there's stunts yeah. and everything. And they just have to come on and be on straight away. So I can, I can understand the frustration for if you're not getting a chance to do that yeah again i think the main problem here is the fact that what the result of what he got so upset about yeah. is so not worth it <laughs> the I mean, I mean but that's always the you know christian bale obviously is trying to make this film work mm-hmm. as an actor the fact <laughs> that it doesn't work is not necessarily his fault but he's still he's not you know he's not phoning this in at least he, well, would, he would argue that he's we, not we don't know. Him. We don't know at what order this film was shot in. That's if true. this was his first day on set, that's true. Maybe he was phoning it in the rest of the time. He was still in Batman mode, <laughs> and then he thought, "Well, fuck it. If it's the kind of film where the DOP is just going to walk into shot while I'm acting, then I might as well not care either." He really does talk like like with his Batman. voice. He's so Batman film, voice all the way through this. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It is it's really bad. It is. Does maybe he, actually... he was. Maybe he was going back and doing pickups for the Dark Knight. Yeah, maybe. Right? Yeah, <laughs> well, while he was ADR, filming this, some ADR. Yeah. yeah. At one point, he says the phrase, "I'm John Connor," and I was seriously thinking he was going to say. I'm Batman. I know. Like, I was waiting for oh, it. Yeah. It's so bad. And let's not dwell too long on the horribly forced in, regrettable piece of dialogue. I'll be back. Oh, no. I'll be back. Actually, you know. I wanted him to say, I'll be Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be Bark, man. You know, you know what also feels forced in is uh, John Connor listening to the tape of his mum. Oh, yeah. It's, that's Linda Hamilton. It's, is it really? Yeah. No. Yeah. I'm Even gonna, she gonna, couldn't do it. What happened to her self righteousness of uh, Terminator Three? She dropped that out the window pretty bloody quickly, didn't she? I reckon she? she just got paid a fortune to record a couple of lines, and she said, "All right." Okay, I clearly wasn't paying attention in the end credits because I stopped it as soon as I could. I think it's but- uncredited. I, oh, right. Mm-hmm. Well, I remember thinking, this this actress can't even do a credible <laughs> Linda Hamilton impersonation. Well, it was, it, and oh, it's also it's, it's, it's such awkward dialogue that's just there for us. Yep. And what yeah. to make matters worse, he listens to it a second time. Because he needs to review the tapes to check that she didn't mention anything about Terminators with human organs. And, like, he says that. He says that to so Kate bad. Brewster. When Kate Brewster comes back in, he's like, my mum didn't say anything about, uh, about Terminators with human organs. And you're like, dude, you had to review the tapes? You were listening to them, like, half an hour ago. Yeah, all you do is listen to those damn tapes. This is tape number 28 of Sarah Connor to my son, John. What's most difficult for me is trying to decide what to tell you and what not to. Should I tell you about your father? Will it affect your decision to send him back in time to protect me, knowing that he is your father? And he'll be younger than you, only a teenager, when you meet him. God, a person could go crazy thinking about this. But if you don't send Kyle, you can never be, and Skynet will win the war. The, interestingly, though, Linda Hamilton worked in on Chuck with McGee, who produced Chuck, so the, oh. he has a relationship with Linda Hamilton. Not in the same way James Cameron did. No. <laughs> okay, not in the same way. But a working relationship. Let's move on to everybody's favourite Australian Hollywood actor. Sam Worthington. Can I leap to his defence straight away? Sure. Go ahead. I think this is Sam Worthington's best Hollywood performance. He's one of those actors who I think was quite good in the Aussie stuff I saw him in, the TV shows and whatnot I saw him in before he hit big. And then, of course, he went to the stratosphere and they do that thing where it feels like the Hollywood producers, they're trying to anticipate who's going to be the next biggest star and they sign him up to four huge films before the response to the first ones even happened. So he, so he had uh, this and Clash of the Titans and he had Avatar. It was like, bam, bam, bam. Yep. I he's can't huge. argue that this is better than Clash of the Titans or Avatar. I, his I performance? His right? performance? Yeah, yeah it is. I actually, notwithstanding the fact that he has a silly accent, I genuinely think he's really good in this film and I like his character. Yeah. I really do. Uh, I like the idea that he's playing a, a Terminator that's too human to be a good Terminator. Um, and John Connor is supposed to be human, but for most of the film, he's, he's a soulless killing machine. Yeah. And then he's, in the end, saved by a Terminator. On the macro level, I understand what they were trying to do there, and I kind of like the idea. But it, that's, that's the calling card of the writers of both the, of T3 and T4. I, I get what they're trying to do, but they don't succeed. <laughs> Seriously. Exactly. Like, well, I think w- T3 is a fine jumping-off point, and I think this is a fine jumping-off point, but the writers aren't good enough or don't draft enough or whatever yeah, they're, they're very, to, to nail it. They're That's, clearly very good at pitching to the yeah, executives. Absolutely. <laughs> and I find Marcus yeah. right in this underwhelming because I see him as amazing potential. And this is a fantastic idea to take the Terminator 
Terminator robots into this direction or Terminator uh, androids or whatever they are in a whole new direction. But I don't think they nail it yeah. quite as well as, as they should have. And maybe because they had to rewrite and put more John Connor in, maybe we lost a whole bunch of Marcus Wright yeah. stuff that would have made it good. I, you, I think Sam Worthington should You make is. a really, really good point there. And I've got a particular point I want to, in regards to exactly what you just yeah. said. All right. So the only thing this film could potentially have going for it is the mystery of who this guy is. Yeah. Right. So except it's totally spoils in the trailers. I haven't seen the trailers for Yeah, I honestly can't remember. I know the trailer spoiled well, it. No, it no, has... no. But I can't remember if I saw the trailer beforehand or not. Okay. The trailer gave away that he was a, a Terminator, right? Watching it this time, pretending I didn't know, was yeah, fantastic. I didn't Th- know. That's... Okay, so that's my point. So we're waiting the entire movie for everyone to catch up on what we already know, at least the yeah. people who have watched the trailers, yeah. all right? So yeah. because it takes so long, you think there's going to be a huge payoff, but all it is is that he exercises free will. Yeah. But right? you can't you can't blame the because you can't blame the film for the trailers. My, this happens all the time. Good movies get shitty trailers that ruin the film my, in advance. My problem with this He's, character is I didn't know why I gave a shit about him. That's exactly. I didn't know why I was paying so much exactly. attention to him or why his story was important to me. Yeah. I didn't know he was a Terminator. Yep. But I also didn't know because I knew he wasn't John Connor and I knew he wasn't Kyle Reese. Well, hang so, on. When it starts, you know he's a bad guy, right? Because he's being executed. He, he murdered someone, right? Yeah, okay, but then he's... So perhaps this is the salvation they're talking about. Who knows? Well, salvation is what you need when you watch this film. The, um, <laughs> yeah. I did it with a Pixar film straight after, but you can do it however you like. I was really confused as to why I got... So, there was so much screen time for this character who I didn't... Okay, fair enough. He was killed at the start, and we have to assume that he died, and maybe he went into a coma and he's awoken. Yeah, sure. Like, I, I had no real solid evidence we can tie this back to T2 though because remember the fact that Arnie was a a good guy in that film presumably Cameron didn't want that spoiled but it was spoiled in the trailers was it not yes yeah Yeah, that's that's another that was an important part of the marketing of the film was that Schwarzenegger's back and he's a good guy yeah Yeah, definitely but I sort of thought about you know how unfulfilling this sort of storyline with Marcus is and and I came up with I think is something that's a little bit more interesting in the space of like five minutes when I thought about it right so let's say Marcus is sent from 2031 or something or sometime after John failed to take out Skynet in 2029 and have him be this brand new prototype post TX Terminator yep that was sent back with prior knowledge of how important John was to find him and kill him without his prior knowledge and for him to not be human at all, but believe he's human, and then exercise free will. Yeah. That is a story. Yeah, yeah. I guess- Instead, we get a big mud- muddled pile of shit. Well, like, I, I guess what they were <laughs> like- trying to do, the, the suggestion here is that this is a failed model of Terminator. Am I right? Well, because, yeah. because he ends up fighting against Skynet, right? So this is why they then, they ditch that idea. Yeah. Skynet, supposedly. I, that makes a kind of sense. But isn't part of the plot that his job was to lure John Connor back to Skynet so he could be eliminated? Like, does Marcus Wright even fail in this film? Well, no, but after that point, when after he starts fighting back, yeah, he, right. he helps him blow up Skynet. So, I, yeah. yeah. You'll, you'll be talking for hours if you're trying to make sense of some can we, plot stuff in this Can film. we move on to an awesome actor, Anton Yelchin? Who plays Kyle Reese. And is such a good impersonation. Can yeah, I, just, I, yeah, it's I good. think he does really well in this. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think he's the saving grace. I found him a mirror to the original Kyle Reese. Oh, he's amazing. I he doesn't he even does look like him, he but doesn't. his performance he, and his it, facial the voice. expressions and the voice. Yeah, I think he does. I wouldn't say an impersonation, but definitely there's a likeness. There's definitely a continuation, and he he nails it. He's and, so good. And when you think about the characters he's played uh, in Star Trek, he does does really good version of Chekhov. Yep. And yep. even in the Fright Night remake, where he <laughs> plays ordinary teenage. He does that too. I yeah, just, right. just this guy's awesome. He, um, he was the only reason I found this film watchable. But mm-hmm. also, yeah. I guess, because I knew that was Kyle Reese and I knew he was a key character. But I, I, th- I thought he was exceptional. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense that he now becomes the key target for Skynet. It doesn't make any sense at all. But, uh, but the act, you're right. The performance of the character and the way that he channels Michael Bean is like really, really good. I think Anton's the, um, the saving grace of this film. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, it's very good. I think he's very good. Moon Bloodgood. The How's best name. name. Yeah, yeah. I, I love it when her name turns up in a film just because I'm like, that's the most that? awesome name. Moon I technically, Bloodgood. part of me wants it to be Blood God. Anyone that has that cooler. many O's in their name needs respect. That's, that's a lot of O's. <laughs> that's do a character O's. name in response to her real name as well. Blair Williams. Yes. Yeah, well, kind of <laughs> Pretty boring. <laughs> McGee characterizes her as continuing the feminine strength that has been prominent throughout the franchise. Is he serious? <laughs> she's a pair of tits yeah she is she is she is um, she, she feels stronger. like she was written in the last moment to me oh yeah 
Um, because she she doesn't appear for like the first forty minutes or yeah. something, yeah. does she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it's also unclear about the Blair Williams Marcus Wright relationship, and it's all very it's just underdeveloped and. Like, shouldn't she have fallen for him a bit stronger? It's still a bit vague. But is she still this brave warrior? And is she is she a pair of tits that John Connor uses to... Like, I don't know. It's just bad. McGee certainly thought so. Let's play a little bit of audio from Comic-Con 2008. And the reason why I wanted Moon to stand up is a big lightning rod. Where are my friends from Warner Brothers? Do you want to see Moon's boobs in the picture? Because we shot them. And it's turning out to be something that we're not sure if it's going to go in the movie. And I want to take the temperature of this room. All right. Who does not... That's deeply unprofessional mm. <laughs> to an obeying audience wow. of morons. No, seriously. Like, I, take, like, I take it back, actually. He, he is a bit Michael Bay. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it took this audio to make uh, Stu understand. Well, yeah. Anyway, Bryce, another uh, great female character in this film. Uh, Bryce mm-hmm. Dallas Howard plays Kate Connor. Yeah, I love this because Adam actually had to explain to me that Kate Connor is uh, Claire, Claire Danes. Danes' character from the third film. Yeah, I don't think I, I realised. no idea. And, until so, Adam mentioned it. She was a vet. Now she's a physician. Is that apparently? That, that kind yeah. of works. And she's so, pregnant. I mean, in, in terms of movie, yeah. Well, she was really pregnant. Wasn't she was she? really pregnant. Yeah. Which yeah. I, you know, what I kind of like. She's pregnant, but no one makes any reference to it in the film. Yeah, yeah. although they were meant to have a baby according to T three. So I don't know if that was something. Okay, about. but the fact that no one in the film makes reference to the fact she's pregnant, because in the real world, people in your workplace are pregnant, and it doesn't necessarily factor into your daily wow. conversation. It's just one of those things that you don't usually see in film unless it's important to the plot. Yeah, so they but, have it's, it, but it's a real life thing that's happening. Yes, yeah. and that's fine. Well, yeah, I that's mean, right. I, they probably run out of condoms, so yeah. it's entirely possible. <laughs> what do they use as condoms in the future when everything's been destroyed? That's, yeah. that's an effort. Everyone's just getting pregnant. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be explored in the real um, chat for co-produced re- really, uh, Terminator 6. Yeah. <laughs> Terminator 6. <laughs> Correct. Um, what is she... Bring to this. Was she, was she written out a little bit with Ing? No, she would. I don't know. It's just. It's all. I know she was brought in late, like like Claire Danes was. I know that she wasn't a, one of the original choices. But well, uh, I mean, as I mentioned in Jurassic oh, yes. World, I just feel so sorry for this actress. I know because I think she can be really good, but she gets these rotten roles. Yeah, she I really agree. does. I think she could be great. She's very charismatic and um, she's fine in this. She doesn't do anything wrong. She doesn't do anything wrong. The character's just awful. It's underwritten. It's just nothing and, and doesn't exist. Yep. I you know. need someone for Christian Bale to bark at everybody. There's now, anything everybody else. We can say. I'll be back, man. Yeah. <laughs> Helena Bottom Carter plays Dr. Serena Kogan and Skynet as well, yeah. which we need to. Yeah. Which is really bad. Huh. Anyway, That's fine. Whatevs. Skynet just works better in implication every time. I'll take the oh, form of just... someone you will trust. So why didn't Ronald Someone we've him? already paid for to appear in this film. Yes. So she's like an ex Cyberdyne scientist who convinces Marcus to donate his body for a research. Apparently, bro, she accepted this part because her domestic partner, Tim Burton, is a Terminator fan, apparently. Oh, there you go. It's, is that to... why Danny Elfman accepted it? Because his life partner is a Most Terminator Most likely to. <laughs> yes, that's yes. Good. That's the only connection I could see because yeah. I saw both their names come up in the credits nearby to each other. I'm like, oh, there's the connection. She's hardly in it. She's in it about five minutes. But how do you think that she does? I think she's really good. Sorry. Okay. I think she's always good. She has one of those awful bits where she is just playing on a TV and she obviously didn't have any, anyone to act act to and she still does a good job and that's just because I think she's a really good actress yeah I mean she brings something to a role that's underwritten like all the roles in this film are and she still brings a bit of gravitas and she's I mean she's got a lot of depth she's a great actor she brings a lot of um, intelligence even to something as mindless as this shit in regards to the supporting cast I'm just going to make mention of uh, good old Michael Ironside who (laughs) plays General Ashdown the leader of the resistance Um, he apparently accepted the role in the movie despite having just broken three vertebrae in a roofing accident and if you have a look at him closely throughout the movie, he never sits down because of the intense pain. It's uh, strange because uh, I was thinking this is one of the rare films where he doesn't lose a limb. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. Or both, actually. More than one limb in some cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's his so, thing. That's his calling card. Yeah. He loves to lose a so limb. So I, I did wonder, because I'd forgotten that he was in the film, when, when the sub blows up, I'm like, oh, we're going to get a shot of his arm getting blown off just before he drowns. But we didn't. It was a pity. There's one thing um, that uh, Michael Ironside says in the film as well. This is where T3 and Salvation actually contradict each other. In T3, it was said that Skynet was everywhere. 
it had gone into the computers yep. and networks and stuff like that. There was no central point for it to be destroyed. And then Michael Ironside in this film says, now to bomb Skynet. So it isn't everywhere. It's in one place. Brilliant. I mean... Yeah, that that is a huge problem that they created with T3 by saying that there is no central control, Skynet's everywhere. Um, it's a problem that would come back to bite them with Genesis too. Oh, yeah. Um, but it was a very realistic way to approach Skynet, but at the same time, it wrote them into a corner. And all they did was just ignore it in the future. And mm-hmm. I can see why they did. Because then your enemy really is unstoppable. I don't really buy the technology in this film either. Like, as in, we keep being reminded that they're on the brink. Yeah. They're not on the brink. (laughs) They're not. Like, they have have helicopters and they have high-end technology. They also have the ability to do a heart transplant at the end of the film as well. Like, the credibility is... It's, it's, it's a mishmash. It's a it's mishmash. such a mishmash. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. Okay. Just, just quickly on the on the world in the film, it doesn't really look like it's been nuked. I don't know about what you guys thought. Um, oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't think that this it looks it, like it's it, been nuked. I don't know. It, it looked brown so. and grey. We established what this. About, what about the, uh, the the car that uh, the little girl and Carl Reese and uh, Marcus Wright come across as well? I mean, um, if that car had been a nuclear holocaust, a lot more would have happened to it other than just losing its doors. Um, <laughs> I don't first know, of all, the cassette player and the cassette inside uh, certainly wouldn't work. You know how they start playing the music? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Enough, I don't know enough about nuclear blasts. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. Maybe maybe cassettes maybe. are designed to withstand I, it. When Marcus turns up at the petrol station before the giant Transformers turn up, um, we realise that Michael Bay has been making a lot of money, and we need Transformers in our movie. Yeah, big Transformers, big he, ones. He gets to the petrol station, looks around to see if there's anything dangerous. He totally does the T eight hundred head turn. Oh, really? He does. He does the, haven't, eye, haven't the, the eyes out. first and then the head following. Oh, nice. And if you've watched, if, if you watch it knowing that he's a Terminator, it's really friggin' obvious. And you know the other time, and you've got to remind me on this because my knowledge of T1 and T2 isn't as encyclopedic as your own, he stabs the guy in the shoulder at one stage. And I seem to remember that happens... In T2? Oh, oh yeah, he stabs in the, the guy in, in, the, in, the, in the shoulder into the, the pool table. Yeah, that also happens... In Terminator Salvation, and I don't think it was a coincidence as well. Yeah, nice. And oh, that, okay. was, that was a case of Marcus doing Terminator things before we knew he was a Terminator, yeah, which I thought yeah. was kind of cool. Yeah. If you watch this film looking out for a few throwbacks to 1 and 2, they are there. And it's funny, in, I like in, a, those moments. in a subtle way, yeah, in a really way that subtle. Terminator 3 wasn't. They have to be subtle. It's yeah. more effective. Yeah, yeah. 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 Anyway, so uh, they're kind of cool. The T-800 scenes, I'm going to jump to the end of the film here. CGI Arnie's little cameo. What do you guys think of... Do you think it was a good move to do this? Um, it does bring into question, can these films be done without Arnie, even if it is a cameo? If it's okay, it's fun. It's not overplayed. I actually thought, watching it the second time, I forgot he gets dispatched so quickly. He's just off camera very quickly. You have to get rid of him quickly because the effects are so bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. It didn't even look that bad this it time. I, bad. What I'm saying is I remembered it looking worse. It reminded me of the Pupperhead stuff in Terminator 1. I tell you, it's... Yeah, I think they, they do it a lot better in Genesis. It's yeah. come a long way in the last couple of years uh, compared to... Salvation. I didn't mind it. I mean, they foreshadow it early on as well, because you yeah. see they're working on his physique in the, like a computer readout, yeah. which is kind of nice. Also as well, bro, so the, the film temporarily gets um, renamed uh, Throwinator as well in, in this scene with Arnie <laughs> as well, because, um, I mean, can you take a film seriously where, you know, the whole point of what Skynet is trying to do is uh, take out John Connor. It's the whole premise of the entire franchise, really. And when he gets his hands on um, Christian Bale in that last sequence as well, when he could just, like, grab him, break his neck like it's a Terminator, yeah. right? He just throws him. He's a Terminator. He's but not he a play with for a while and then into terminate. some equipment in the factory yeah. and... Uh, John Connor pretty much just brushes himself off and says... Hey, like, you know, he's, next- just, he's just come off the production line, dude. Give him a break. He didn't exist 30 seconds ago. Are you seriously trying to defend <laughs> that? <laughs> I'm, not, is, I'm um, not. There is, there is a version of this film. Uh, there's a scene that they took out where the Terminator makes uh, Christian Bale's John Connor watch T3 <laughs> to try and kill him that way. Um, that would be more effective, I think. Yeah, it would, but they deleted that. Does this scene sort of also make you sort of feel, can they do a Terminator movie? without Arnie even if it is a I don't know I, I, look as bad as I found the effects and as bad as it, it all was I, I liked a little reference to, to to Arnie and the technology and the fact that he's a robot and I, I had no problems with it from a creative standpoint that was fine can they do one without him probably but who cares if you can put him in that way he still would have got paid even for that well that so. was the film where they could have done one without him and they yeah, didn't and they didn't so now can they do a film without him yeah, eh, probably, probably not. not did he get paid 
he would have got paid yeah, for his something. likeness. He'd yeah. have to get paid for his At likeness. At least twenty million dollars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just take um, one third of my T three fee, yeah, which is still, chicken feed. Yeah. Still more than I'm ever going to earn my life. Um, there's a really bad redesign of the endoskeleton in this film as well. Unnecessary um, uh, redesign. Yeah, they, just, yeah. they just try and make it look more evil, don't they? And they try and make it look yeah, the traps more stronger. Are they try make, overdone. Yeah, yeah, the traps like are ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's 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 overblown and ridiculous. Is that the T eight hundreds? Is that the Arnie yeah. models, or are they the other? This is the eight hundred, not different? the eight fifty. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, what about the eight seventy five? Exactly. You know, you know the uh, the Terminator I liked, the one with the Gatling gun arms early on that the gets T-600. caught in the trap. T six hundred. Um, they're, they're mentioned in the first movie. They're the ones with the rubber skin. Oh, there you go. Um, I quite liked that they're effect. They're really big and clunky, so they're not very good infiltration. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I quite liked the effect of that. It looked like it was a guy in a suit, and then they digitally removed the guy, you know, so that he had, you know, holes. You so could see through the metal. Really, I thought that was a good practical effect, is all I'm saying. They've given them, like, Transformers-like sound effects as well. Like, they would, they're, not, they're yeah. really awful infiltrators. They're, they're I know. At one big. point, one of them says, Terminators, roll out. So, you know, it's very derivative of Transformers. <laughs> The original ending, and this is not as made up as this is going to sound as well. It was, <laughs> it was, it was rumored that they were going to put John Connor's face onto Marcus. So the idea was going to be that Marcus was going to be a machine who claimed to be John Connor. But the actual original ending was going to be exactly that. And then everyone comes into the room, including his wife, Kate. So they go, wow, this is John Connor. Because they had the tech for this kind of procedure too, apparently. And then he was to stand up and shoot everyone in the head. No joke. Kyle, Kate, John's black friend, Common, and then Skynet wins the end. <laughs> I don't think he was... black friend, Common. Barnes. You mean Barnes. <laughs> I don't think it was called Common in the film. Isn't that no. the actor's name, though? Yeah, it is. His acting's very <laughs> common. But Skynet wins the end. Yeah, right. right. And Bale said, let's do that. I totally want to do that American Psycho style. Yeah, right. Because he's insane. And <laughs> McGee said no because of planned sequels and shit, right? So... When I read this, I was like, is that just made up? No, apparently it was considered. Wow. Apparently it was all going to happen to the music of Hugh Lewis and the News, too. <laughs> Which song? Just like American Psycho. So. Which song? <laughs> no, not um, <laughs> Power of Love from Back to the Future. Bing! <laughs> um, I still, I quite like the whole heart transplant thing. I know it's absurd. Taking the tech out of it, you like it. I like Marcus's character trajectory. It yeah. works well for me. Because that's the only way. I mean, he's a convicted murderer. Like, how yeah. are we supposed to f- feel for this guy? Oh, he finally, he did this in the end. And it makes sense because they would never trust him after that point, after they realized he worked for, he was working for Cyberdyne unwittingly the whole time. I do wonder, he got completely destroyed at one point, then goes into the Cyberdyne factory and then gets fixed up in the space of like three minutes. Yeah. It's like really strange. It's, <laughs> yeah, anyway. After HBC talks to him, suddenly he's like, all schmick rejuvenated again. okay <laughs> Bruce is enthralled <laughs> at this point I'm just confused where we're up to in the, in the, in the podcast we've done okay. cast and uh, okay now where are we is, we're up to the little special section Bruce where the special uh, special section, section. Super Terminators. What are Super Terminators, Adam? I'm confused. James Cameron's known for his extremely realistic portrayal of the sci-fi characters and elements. Just like he does with all of his creations, James Cameron carefully thought up the technical data and details for the Terminators Ah. to inject as much plausible reality into them as possible. Mm. He was recently described as someone who doesn't create science fiction, but science facts. Terminators weren't some kind of super strong robots. That's one of the reasons why the character didn't join other 80s cliche characters, which nowadays seem ludicrous. It wasn't a big bad robot who could lift the car and would be immune to everything it wasn't a comic book character it wasn't the incredible hulk it had thought and realism behind it the terminator doesn't have any super strength it has a strength of an extremely strong man but not something truly unnatural it can be hurt by the same things people can but has an extra invulnerability it's far from being over the top it gets knocked down and hurt by large caliber guns and by car crashes once the franchise has been bought and continued by others Terminators become something of an over-the-top cartoon. Their strength not only contradicted the original movies, but even contradicted what has been presented on screen by the same writers. Everything is now over the top. The Terminators having Marvel superhero-like strength and ridiculous invulnerability, even making loud thumps when walking. The first non-Cameron Terminator movie already took out all the realism possible associated with the franchise. It placed Terminator movies in a fictional sci-fi world and became a pure fantasy with no link or reference point to the real world. And that was the case with everything. 
But here we want to focus on just some of the inconsistencies and over the top betrayal of the Terminators by John Brocanto and Michael Ferris. Some may say the differences in T3 is the upgrade in the T850 model, but isn't it a large stretch just to have an upgrade on a model and have it 10 times stronger and even more powerful than the model of the same series? Or have it been stronger than more advanced models? Even if the difference in power could be explained with a slight model upgrade, the fact remains with the betrayal of the Terminators remains over the top and cartoonish, and there's no explaining why the T-800 in Terminator Salvation is even stronger than the T-850 in Terminator 3. That being said, <laughs> yes. it, it never entirely made sense. It all made sense if Lance Henriksen had been the Terminator. That stance on the idea being that they're not that strong. They're an infiltration unit. Yeah. We always had to ignore the fact that we had the Austrian Oak playing... The Terminator, mm. who looks ridiculous, couldn't infiltrate anywhere. And if you ask the average person if the Terminator has superhuman strength, everyone would say yes. I understand that was Cameron's original vision, but I don't think so even his films. The other thing do too that. is that Cameron's kind of put future filmmakers over a barrel when the T one thousand is infinitely more powerful than T eight hundred. They've got to get stronger with each incarnation, and each film based on T2 needs to up the ante and have a new incarnation of a Terminator as well. Now you're right, but my main issue here is the way that the 800 yeah. changes, the strength yeah. of the one yeah. the one model, right? Can I just make a couple of very, very quick references from the movies themselves? Um, sure. There's Matt puts up a fight against the T800 in the first one, you know, uh, Sarah's roommate Ginger. Oh, yeah. Her, her boyfriend is like a, he's like a yeah, gymnast he's or something. He's the guy from Roxanne. Yeah, and he's also from Top Gun as well. Um, he, he sort of pushes him and moves him and fights him for a while, but he, he holds his own in, in that battle for like quite a bit. I mean, he's not going to win, obviously. Yeah. Also, you know, the T-800 gets blasted from Kyle's shotgun um, and was even stunned and seriously hurt, hand damaged by the, you know, in the, in the eye and stuff yep. like that. He couldn't get through the worn out, beaten up old iron doors in the factory at the end of the first film as well. I mean, it had to beat at it for like ages and ages. He's also blown in half by a homemade pipe bomb as well in the first film, okay? Yep. And then in T2, Miles Dyson can't open the small safe that held the key in the vault and the T-800 couldn't just walk open and open it like he could if he was in yep. 3 or, or this one. He doesn't even think about trying to take down the steel doors. He destroys them with a grenade launcher. He's shown putting a lot of effort into removing the metal plate covering the weapons in the pit in the desert. And he has to use a crowbar to break his arm to get free when the T-1000 puts him into the gears. Yeah, right. And then in T3, so this is where it all changes up, right? But how much of that, though, is about economy? And comes back to his idea of being the perfect killer or the perfect terminator that he, he does everything economically and uh, tries to do everything as, as effectively and as, as he can. And all those things that you mentioned, using the crowbar and, and using the, the grenade launcher, etc., isn't that being economic and intelligent about it rather than just being physical? It doesn't say that he couldn't do it physically, yep. but it means it's quicker to do it with the crowbar. And it's, but yep. the thing is, I, and, and to, to support your point, James Cameron actually thought about those things. Yes. Whereas these guys clearly didn't think about anything. Yeah. They just went, he's a superhero, like, he's, he can just go and do whatever he wants, he can be as strong as we want him to be. Like, Whereas James Cameron went, well, no, and why, would he, why wouldn't he use a crowbar if it was available to him, if that's going to be quicker? And why wouldn't he do this and why wouldn't he do that? Yeah. Whereas these guys are just going, oh, well, he can just do everything himself. Yeah, and just yeah. very quickly, a couple of references from 3 and 4, like, uh, you know, the Terminator, like, um, bashes in the car after it, in Terminator 3 when it can't um, decide if it wants to kill or save John Connor. And yep. it's, yeah. And so if it, it smashes the bonnet of the car, if there was a person there, it'd smash their head in in a second. Um, yeah, right. This is the T850 from the third one again. It kicks the ambulance like a toy. Yeah. The whole ambulance falls over, like when he kicks it. He breaks the TX's hand, squashing it like a bug uh, when it's under the blast doors. By the way, it can, it can support the blast doors yeah. as well, super strong. Um, and then in this one, the T-800's resistance is brought to a completely ridiculous level where it takes two direct hits from a grenade launcher with no problems other than losing its flesh concealment. He didn't even fall or lose balance. He just leaned over and instantly straightened up again. Um, so we're, we're, certain, we're sure this isn't a T-890. Or a T eight eighty three, or maybe a, the, maybe the writers would use that if they were asking the questions. It's not a T nine hundred; it's a T eight nine nine. But the big one as well in this film, he snaps the T six hundred in half with his bare hands. You know, he just walks up to that T six hundred that's going crazy and just breaks, breaks it in it half. Up. Yeah, like that, that, this is my point. I'm just saying that the Terminators become they go from Terminators yeah, to, to super, super Terminators. Terminators. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and if these super Terminators appeared, or at least they appeared in this way in earlier films, they would have become a, a Jason in a, in a horror film or a, that yeah. kind of thing, yeah. So just a little bit of trivia here from uh, Terminator Salvation, the best bits. I think we mentioned this in the last episode, Bro's special effects wizard Stan Winston died uh, just Stan. during the filming Tragic. of this film. Tragic. This is the last film that he provided any sort of visual effects for. The film's also dedicated to his I, th I think there needs to be a, a real chat list at some point of 
amazing film artisans that have had films dedicated to them that they probably based, don't want to be dedicated. They don't want. <laughs> Yeah. Because just because you know the last film you worked on before you die is, is no guarantee that's your best film. Can't we? But he's not necessarily. I I don't know a, a specific crew, a specific professional on a film crew. Are they concerned about whether the entire film is good, or, or are they just concerned about whether their work in the film was good? Is the work his work in this film good? I guess it is. At the Seven Eleven hideout, Carl Reese can be seen eating what appears to be a Twinkie, which is jokingly referred to as a food item that could withstand nuclear fallout. <laughs> That's, a, that's, a, that's an existing joke about Twinkies, I think. Yes. Is it? That's a big Twinkie. That's a, <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's other references to Twinkies. That, the old cockroach line that yeah. Twinkies are the only things that will survive a Holocaust, yeah. The trick with keeping a shotgun attached around the arm that Marcus shows Carl Reese is used by an older Carl Reese played by Michael Bean at the beginning of the original Terminator after he saws off the butt to sort of shorten the shotgun he stole from the police uh, squad car. Mm-hmm. So there's a little character yeah, moments there that they're back. sort of putting in. I don't, I don't mind that stuff. That's all right. Yep. Did you know uh, Terry Crews was cast as Captain Jericho, but his scenes ended up being cut from the final. Oh. Wow, film. I love Terry Crews. However, Crews is still visible in one scene as a dead body oh. left in the aftermath of a battle, and he is there. Wow. It's definitely him as well. So, yeah, he's in the film, but he's dead. So, <laughs> he's just a corpse. Christian Bale is one of eight actors to play John Connor. <laughs> wow. In Terminator 2 Judgment Day, the adult John Connor was played by Michael Edwards, the teenage John Connor was played by Edward Furlong, and the infant John Connor, who appeared during Sarah Connor's dream sequence of the nuclear attack, was played by Dalton Abbott. Nick Stahl played the fourth John Connor in Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines. Thomas Decker played John Connor in the TV series Terminator the Sarah Connor Chronicles, with John DeVito playing a younger John in a flashback. And then, of course, Jason Clark succeeded Bale in the role of the Terminator Genesis. And I can reveal that Terminator 6, co-produced by Real Chat Productions, Adam will be playing the infant John Connor, um, <laughs> which we're all looking forward to. Also, that. we don't care. <laughs> if, if they're not going to try. <laughs> <clears throat> as uh, I think we touched upon as well, Stu, this was intended to be the first of a new Terminator Future War trilogy. Yes. Um, all done by McGee. Should we be so lucky? Uh, but In this the, instance, but, McG stands for McGone. <laughs> and no one's sad about that. But the film's poor performance and reception led to McG being fired and replaced before the next two films ever came to fruition. Instead, as we know, a new trilogy is planned to begin with Terminator Genesis. Yep. Yeah. So we're giving this another crack. Christian Bale later stated that before the film, he expressed the same concerns to McG that the Terminator fan base was expressing to him taking over the franchise. Bale told him that nothing in your filmography suggests that you have what it takes to do this movie properly. McG ultimately convinced Bale to give him a chance so he could evolve as a director, but as of 2014 admits that the film didn't work, insinuating that it was ultimately McG who blew it and stating that he would never work with McG ever again, though he wishes him well. Not something that Bale has to worry about because they're not on the same trajectory. Yeah, exactly. Like, there is no chance that Bale will ever have to work with McG again. Let's talk about the DVD and Blu-ray releases for... Shall we? Uh, well, a little bit. Very, very briefly. No, for sure, for sure. Okay, 2009 DVD and Blu-ray release. The main thing about this Blu-ray, Bros, and I really didn't want to put you through this, of course, so I didn't. Um, instead of a traditional commentary, yeah. there is a supplement called Maximum Movie Mode. Whoa! A feature that contains the director standing in front of a pair of screens that show on the left the film and on the right behind the scenes elements. Um, just hearing about this... And how I feel about McGee's work, I couldn't think of anything worse. So there was no way that I was even going to you know, check this I out. don't get this. Who this, cares? this pop-up video shtick, which is kind of what it is. Show me the special features over here. Show me the film here. Why would I ever want to watch both at once? It's just bizarre. Yeah, and there's a couple of other, like, you know, making of docs on there and that. But otherwise, uh, nothing much of note. Um, I'm not really interested in this, bro. So I no. think we're going to move straight on Let's to move on. the music. And in Andrew's absence, we're going to talk a little bit about... Who did the music for this one? How's this? Danny Elfman. Yeah. Isn't that a bizarre choice? Who, well, the last 10 years or so, has done scores that haven't sounded like Danny Elfman. Think back to the, the late 80s, 90s, all Danny Elfman scores. You could, you could tell straight away it was Danny Elfman. Am oh, I yeah. right? Oh, yeah. He had a very strong sense of whimsy and, and there was a hauntingness about them. And Yeah, in a similar sense that Philip Glass's more recent scores don't sound mm. like Philip Glass. No, they don't at all. Danny Elfman doesn't repeat himself quite so much now. And they might be bland scores, but they just find it interesting that after all this time, he suddenly changed and went, I'm not going to do my trademark stuff. Yeah. Does, I, I found the Danny Elfman, he did Spider-Man. Was yeah. It? And I found that very... 
non-Elfman of him as yeah. well. And, and and I didn't mind that score. And this one... This one sounds like it came out of a Marvel film or a Transformers film or something. Yeah, like which is obviously what McG is going to go for. Oh, like, yeah. yeah I, I do find it interesting that the film starts off with the Terminator theme. So it's making up for number three, which hardly included it at all. No. Oh. <laughs> if you're talking about that... Sorry. Yeah. They use the Terminator beat. Okay. But there's no theme. They, he's composed a new theme at the start. Yep, it's not yep, memorable yep, at all. Yep. But it's there. It's the but drum beat, dude. Yes. Leave dude. me alone. <laughs> Still referencing something about things, isn't it? It's really weird about that on the soundtrack as well, um, yeah. Stu, because that part of the music that you're talking about with the theme, that is not on the soundtrack. So it's almost like that was actually put in later. Oh. The soundtrack version doesn't actually include that. So it's almost like that was put in because someone said late in the process, ooh, we better put that in there, otherwise people won't know this is a Terminator film. But it's not like they print the CD. Do they print the CDs before the the, the score is locked? Soundtracks. Soundtrack versions compared to film versions differ all the time. Yeah, yeah. I always assume that's usually because they're doing sweet versions of the tunes and they want them to be a bit more song-like for listening to. Yeah. Yeah. But McG wanted to discuss scoring the film with Hans Zimmer, surprise, surprise, but he was unable to arrange a meeting. So maybe Zimmer didn't want to go anywhere near McG's film. McG met with the Terminator and Terminator 2 composer Brad Fidel, but was not interested in repeating the sounds Fidel achieved in his films. They wouldn't have worked in this film, though, in in McG's defence. That really metallic, very... Uh, rhythmic uh, percussive sound that Fidel has and that electronic feel as well yeah. they're not going to work with the, the wastelands of Mexico and all that yeah. the only other time that Terminator beat rocks up is when Arnie rocks up yep as well so it's really there, w- there were the quite a few it. a few cheers in the cinema when that happened when we see where it starts on his feet the shot doesn't it and, yeah. and the beat kicks in and then the camera tilts up well, it's like the, the that cl- was a pretty exciting moment in the like, cinema just because I didn't know it was going to happen yeah it's, I guess that's the, the closest the closest you get to anything exciting happening in this movie <laughs> isn't it so um, and uh, there is a soundtrack release as well bros it's just Danny Elfman's score 15 tracks of it one song apparently uh, again I think it does its job okay, but it's really not memorable, and you're not going to come away. I, I, don't, I wouldn't recommend this soundtrack. Yeah, anybody. some some soundtracks are only available as a limited release, 1,000 or 2,000, 3,000 copies. This was just limited sales. Uh, I think yeah. it, it sold eight. <laughs> yes, so exactly. if you're one of those eight people, good on you for backing Elfman. Good on you, I say. Elfman probably got him, bought him himself. That's right. So, <laughs> uh, but, um, and just quickly, in regards to alternate versions or deleted scenes... If there was one film in which you didn't need a director's cut, uh, it's only three minutes longer, but one good thing in regards to... You know what would be good, a director's cut that was about 60 minutes shorter? Very early on in Real Chat's life, actually, you mentioned that one one of your pet hates is when they give you the extended version of the film, but not the theatrical cut. Yeah. Well, aren't you happy that Terminator Salvation gives you the option out of all the movies that you've... Uh, <laughs> to have both? You, in this one, they give you both. Yeah. Just like you want. Do you, but want, I mean, do you want the extra three minutes or I not? I don't want either cut. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm talking about films that I want a version of. Does it yeah. have an option where you click on a different point of the menu and it shows you a completely different film? Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> really good. <laughs> really good. Here's my but, advice. If you want to see Terminator Salvation... Go and get Charlie's Angels and put it in and just watch that. Yeah. <laughs> and look at it and go, and wow. Throttle. Think of all the potential that McG might have had as a director. Uh, and then that's all you need to do. I have a list in front of me of those those three minutes added back into Terminator Salvation, but I'm going straight past it because I know, no I one cares. They could take longer than three minutes to talk about, and that's more time than they're worth. Yep, exactly. Uh, collectibles, bros. Look, I just want to say I didn't do any collectibles in T3. If you're a completist, Sideshow's Hot Toys have done T3 and T4, 12-inch. Uh, actually, for T4, I think it's just a bust. It's nothing. But there is an awesome photo on one of the websites I've been on. It's one of the fan action figure websites, and it's just a collection of all of the different Terminator 12-inch figures, and it's pretty bloody impressive. So if you're a completist and you want everything, and you've got your T800 and, and your exoskeletons and your T1000s and your John Connors and all that stuff, and then having the shitter film versions of the figures in the background it's kind of nice but yeah Hot Toys has done a bunch of those that's the only thing I would recommend if you're a completist and you've already got all the other Hot Toys 12 inch figures it's worth adding the horrible sequel figures into the background somewhere and and they're beautiful figures Hot Toys make the most beautiful figures available they're now. sensational yeah. one of my favourite companies one of my favourite websites I love looking um, at this what stuff. we're talking about Hot Toys something I'm kind of excited about is that uh, for the Hong Kong Toy Fair or toy show that's coming up soon they're doing a full one six scale Millennium Falcon to go with their new Star Wars figures, which won't be available retail at this point. 
but it will be on display Fantastic. in Hong Kong. Is, is one it, sixth really big? It one, sounds big. One sixth is it'll be five point five meters across. Wow. Okay. And it'll fit twelve inch figures inside it. <laughs> that sounds there you go. rude. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if you're not on the Hot Toys bandwagon already, then uh, well, you get one of those jumpers on and you have a crack. There you go. It's Thanks, Bruce. Yes, yeah. for those Terminator uh, completers. But there, really, at the end of the day, just buy. What, which one have you got? The ones from the first Terminator. I've just got some some great ones that, from the first. That's all you need. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> In regards to the awards, uh, no Academy Awards or nominations, no what? Golden what? Globes. What? Awards what? or nominations? It was I robbed. What? what? What else came out in 2009? Nothing was as good as this. Nothing. Nothing at all. Next. <laughs> Satins. Satins? Yep. Nominations? Best makeup. Nomination. That's okay. it. Okay. That's it. All right. A lot of dirt on people's faces. Yeah. 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 All right. But especially for this episode, bro, just had to pull one out of nowhere. Um, the Alliance of Women Film Journalists nomination sequel that shouldn't have been made. Oh, there you go. There we go. And we can't. So I thought, you know, it was quite fitting to bring that one up, especially for this episode. Rotten Tomatoes certifies Terminator Salvation rotten with a score of 33%. That's a lot more in line with where it should be. That's fair. 88 positive, 179 negative. Wow. And IMDb score, still too generous, bro, 6.7 out of 10. That is high. It is. So let's wrap this up with our traditional five-star review system. And in lieu of Andrew's absence, where is he again this week? Well, it's two weeks in a row he's had off. We've you know what? 30 episodes of this. I've had no weeks off. He, he, he's never seen Terminator 3, but he's seen this one. He, he gave me a text message today. He said, just uh, my review, it's shit. That's, uh, wow. that's uh, Andrew's Wait, review. Wait, hang on, but does he recommend it? <laughs> <laughs> Got to read between the lines of two words. <laughs> yeah. There's not all the lines to read in between there, Andrew. You've let us down. What about Danny Elfman's? Oh, come on, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Come on! <laughs> it's weird that it's taken me over an hour to realise he wasn't here, but otherwise... <laughs> yeah. otherwise. He's, he's, he's softly spoken. <laughs> he is. He is softly spoken. I'll jump in instead. So gross. Look, I don't think this film's any better, and I don't think it's any worse than T3, so I'm going to give it one and a half stars. I don't recommend it to anybody. The third act, the energy picks up. It's really nice. I like it. The, the weird, overblown Terminator robot battleship stuff is just stupid and forget about it. There's some nice, subtle references to James Cameron's work. There's some callbacks to the Mad Max thing that James Cameron has going on too, which is not terrible. Uh, and uh, what's his name that plays Kyle Reese is sensational. It's worth watching for him. He kept me in this film. But otherwise, one and a half stars. If you haven't seen it, don't. Thanks, bros. Stu. Uh, I agree. Yolchin is is incredible. Uh, I still like uh, Marcus's character trajectory. I still like it for that reason. I'd say it is slightly worse than T3. Uh, I'm still only giving it two and a half stars. I wouldn't bother particularly re- recommending it. Um, it. I just can't get over the fact that Christian Bale and John Connor dragged this film down. It just seems so wrong. Yeah. Like, okay. how how can that happen? E- even if he isn't the central character, he technically should be second build, I suppose. It's just like, how... Oh, I, I can't even credit it. It's the only bad Bale performance. I just don't know what's going on. Yeah, I would recommend that if you don't like Christian Bale, this film will give you plenty of more reasons why not. <laughs> but if you do like him, uh, this film will disappoint you. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Ladies now, and gentlemen. Can I... He's been holding it back for the last hour or so, and it's now time for him to unleash. Can I? Can the I have power. a go? Can I just get it all out here at the end? Uh, so, Dolfo. Yep, we'll turn. We'll turn around so you can uh, just let no, loose no, without no, no. being embarrassed. I want, you, I, want take, I want you to take in. I want you to take in. <laughs> Don't look away. Watch this, me. This is the. This is the final word. The final word with Adam Sandler. Right. So this is a by the numbers film that seems to have the name Terminator in it. McGee says that one of the main reasons people don't like him is because of his name. I have this to say. There are (laughs) many reasons not to like you, McGee. Your name is the least of them. The reason people don't like you is because you can't make films. I'm McGee. I'm an advertising TV commercials director who just happens to have landed on a movie set and have been given this huge dress-up box to throw at our cinema screens. There's only a handful of things that got me through Terminator Salvation because it's so soul-crushingly dull. I mean, it's explosions and crashes and hitting and shooting and shouting. It just goes on and on and on and on. The only two things that kept me sane were me thinking, why did Christian Bale do this? The money? Did he need it? He'd just come off the dark night, so it couldn't have been that. And secondly, why would anyone sign up to a movie that was directed by McG when it is clear from his past track record that one, he can't direct, and two, his sets descend into outright aggression? McG, you got fucking something to say to this prick? I didn't see it happen. 
Here's my take on what I think happened the day Christian Bale had his outburst. The thing with the light and the DOP happened, and then he suddenly had an epiphany. I'm in a fucking movie directed by Mick G. One minute, I was considered to be one of the great acting talents in film today, and the next minute, I'm in this shit Terminator film directed by a talentless hack. I think Bale literally woke up that day and realised what the hell he was doing, and he lost his fucking mind. I have no doubt in my mind that he knew that not only was this film rubbish, but also that he was absolutely rubbish in it. What has happened to the Terminator franchise since James Cameron understandably walked away is a joke and a disgrace to all good moviegoers. I can't for the life of me understand how this film found any sort of audience or mid-range acceptance. Terminator Salvation. First, it's not even really a Terminator movie. John Connor was rewritten as the main character, which puts Marcus right in the background, thus rendering a Terminator character secondary. But even if it was called John Connor Salvation, it still wouldn't make any sense because there is no salvation to be had. Honestly, what is the point of this story? What is the culmination of the events? Skynet wasn't destroyed. The Resistance gained no advantage. Nothing was accomplished. The humans are fighting the machines at the start and at the finish. So what was the purpose of all this fighting? Skynet designs a prototype Terminator doesn't even know he's a Terminator. I thought the machines were supposed to be smart. This Terminator had every opportunity in the world to squish Kyle Reese's head. Don't even get me started on that. But anyway, what the hell was Skynet's plan for killing John Connor? Lure him to the Skynet base? Let him inside to free hundreds of human prisoners? Then send one naked CGI Arnold after him? Are you freaking kidding me? And why was Kyle Reese Skynet's number one target allowed to remain alive for like three days? I don't understand any of this. The world's most advanced intelligence looks like a bunch of dumbasses in this movie. Who the hell wrote this script? I'll tell you who wrote it. The morons who wrote the third one. The acting in this movie is so bad, I can't think of a word to accurately describe just how bad it is. It's that bad. Every line is delivered either with a dramatic whisper or a dramatic shout when the context of the scenes usually calls for neither. Don't people talk in movies anymore? Talking can be dramatic. Yelling when you don't have to and whispering for no reason is just retarded, especially when everything that's said is completely obvious and on the nose. It's not even melodramatic. It's worse. I can't think of one single redeeming quality of this catastrophic disaster of a movie. Salvation is just terrible. It's seriously one of the worst films I've seen in recent memory. A stupid, boring movie with the name Terminator in it, written and directed by imbeciles. I wish I could terminate this movie from existence. I give this film half a star, and I don't recommend it. Goodbye, gentlemen. <laughs> Adam is out <laughs> of the building. And, uh, and that's what I really think. May I repeat earlier news that John D. Brancato and Michael Ferris penning the fourth Back to the Future film that is happening. <laughs> and not only that, <sighs> I've heard that Brancato and Ferris have gone to his house of birth and have burnt it to the ground and stabbed his parents in the heart. <laughs> so there's so many reasons Adam hates these two, and this is the Terminator Salvation is, is the very little, the very least. I just had to let that out. Thank you very much. If you, you got it out. That was good. That was all right. That was good. May it also, there's something that we didn't bring up in T3 or T4. Uh, and I'm going to bring it up now. James Cameron was considering doing a third film. Oh, yeah. And he only walked away from it because of the Titanic thing. Yeah. So we can't shit on people too much for wanting to make sequels when James Cameron himself was considering to do it. It's just unfortunate, and I'm yet to see Genesis, that three and four are good creative ideas to start with, and they just ruin them and, and, and miss the point yeah. completely. So, If you uh, are looking for a good spin-off, just go and watch the TV show. Yeah, which uh, it's good fun. Is, is apparently fantastic. You know and we we've got two seasons out of the two TV show. Yeah. We have one more Terminator episode to do, the new film Terminator Genesis, and I, I think I'll put a section in for the Sarah Connor Sarah Chronicles Connor as well. Because it is a better follow-up to Terminator 2 than any of these other films are, that's for sure. Yeah, at this point, Adam needs to work out some, some of his energy. He needs to, <laughs> he needs to relax. But until uh, we meet again, Adam, uh, I hope you feel better. I do. I hope the red drains from your face and your heart rate uh, lowers to normal I had to get into speeds. it. It was built up. But, uh, uh, but yeah, uh, but yeah oh, that was good anyway, fun. Thanks, thanks, thanks for coming for... in discussion, Terminator Salvation. Oh, I wasn't sure you'd gentlemen. be able to wrap things up. I was trying to do it for you. But you, you're, you're back. That's okay. That's okay. I still got it. I still got it. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, yeah. guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Stay in touch with us by visiting realchat.com.au. Check us out on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter at Real Chat Podcast. Instagram, real underscore chat underscore podcast. And if you haven't already, catch up with past episodes and subscribe to new episodes on iTunes.